check. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Test, test, test. Oh, test, 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 test. No. Check, 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 check. Okay. All right. Alright, if you want to have, Lee, come on this side. You bet you want to come over here and we'll have you stay on this side. I'm going to divvy it up. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Alright, if you guys kind of want to fill in that all works. Out the way. Alright, thank you so much all for joining us here today. Um, we'll get this press conference started right now. General Brnovich is going to talk about this exciting uh, new development in our latest lawsuit against the unconstitutional COVID-19 vaccine mandates. Okay, is this someone's briefcase? Yeah, we just moved I'll move that. Oh, no, thing. sorry. I just uh, made a trip on it. That's the oldest uh, trip in the um, First and foremost, thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate it. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on in the world today, and I want to thank you for joining us. I also want to thank um, the police officers from uh, Plead that are here today, and the United uh, Phoenix Firefighters Association for being here, standing with us as well. As Attorney General, I'm never more proud than when I'm standing with our first responders, um, the brave individuals in law enforcement, their first responders. So, as I said, I'm, I'm never prouder than when I'm standing with uh, our first responders. I do know, or maybe some of you may be asking, well, why are we standing here today? As you know, we were the first state in the country to sue the Biden administration over its unconstitutional vaccine mandates. And the city of Phoenix recently announced, as a result of the contractor rules, that they were mandating all of their city employees uh, either lose their jobs or get the vaccine. I've said this before and I'll say it again, that no one should be required or forced to get the vaccine, that that's a choice of individuals. I also believe very strongly that our first responders should never have to choose between their jobs, their livelihood, and their health insurance uh, versus an unconstitutional vaccine mandate. The fact that uh, the brave women in law enforcement and firefighting are joining us today, I think speaks volumes about not only the merits of our lawsuit, but about the fact that the Biden administration's unconstitutional mandates are not only an infringement on individual liberty, but a uh, fringe on the principles of federalism and violate traditional notions of separation of powers. I know that our country is making great strides in the management of COVID-19, and there have been promising and consistent developments including treating individuals with COVID, but what should never be up for discussion is our Constitution and the liberties recognized. The trampling of our civil rights can never be the right answer. The message I want to leave everyone here with today is that our office will continue to fight on behalf of all hardworking Arizonans, including our first responders. I am proud to stand once again with our law enforcement officials, our hardworking law enforcement and first responders, and I think it's important for us to take principled positions and push, push back against the overreach of the federal government. And now I'd like to introduce and turn things over to Brian Willingham from the United Phoenix Firefighters Association. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thanks for having you. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Brian Willingham. I'm the Executive Vice President of Local 493, the United Phoenix Firefighters Association. We represent over 2,600 firefighters valley-wide, 1,700 in the city of Phoenix. I'm a captain on Engine 25 in Maryvale, which is 63rd Avenue in Thomas. I've been a firefighter for 30 years, three different fire departments, and we are very concerned about a looming crisis with our staffing. We've actually had a staffing crisis for well over a year and a half. We've had staffing issues prior to COVID, and my biggest concern is with our guiding principles and mission of being there to support the community and respond in less than five minutes to medical and fire emergencies, hazardous materials, issues on the, on the mountains with rescues, and all the things that we do to serve our community, that we won't have the ability to staff our units if individuals are forced to retire or, or leave the job in early retirement or be terminated. 
These are our family members. These are people that we care about, that we've worked with, and those people have served this community for decades. We've always been here for our community. We never turn our back to our own family member, and many of our members feel like this is a choice, and we support their right to choose. These individuals all have mortgage payments. They have children. They have expenses, car payments, insurance, just like everybody else in the community. And what I don't think the vast majority of people understand about police and fire is how much we actually already work. The members that we represent, we work 2,912 hours in a year. Somebody who works a 40-hour job works 2,080. We work over 800 hours a year more than every other government employee. We're already maxed out. We're sleep deprived. We've had an exponential increase in PTSD. We have cancers that are going through the roof. These are all things that we have to manage, and we have been mitigating communicable diseases effectively on our fire department for decades. We have personal protective equipment that we utilize when we respond on calls. And it's disheartening to me at this moment because we're having to worry about families. We have people calling us that are, that are upset, they're crying, it's dividing their family members or their own families apart, and it, it's bothersome. And we have always protected our community. We will continue to do so. But if we lose some of our staffing, we will increase our response times. And time is tissue in the fire service. Time is tissue because every second or every minute that goes past six minutes, brain death occurs. We cannot afford to lose staffing. We are not in the midst of a political battle for us. This is a crisis for the community. It's also a crisis for our vaccinated members. If unvaccinated members are terminated, then our vaccinated members have to step up and work even additional hours to, to fill in those gaps. We do not have the manpower and the staffing. I know damn well police, pardon my friends, I know damn well our, our brothers and sisters on the, on the police law enforcement side have an even greater staffing issue than we do. We need this to go back to the way it was and allow our city to manage this like we were effectively doing. That's what our ask is, and I appreciate your time today. Could you spell your name for us so we know we get it? Brian with a Y, Willingham, W-I-L-L-I-N-G-H-A-M. Thank you. Thank you. So we can open it up to questions now. You can ask questions to General Brnovich, either of the um, associations as well, um, whoever you have questions for. Um, who would like to go? Uh, Mark, do you have a question? Should I wait a second? Yeah, sure, sure. That's a first. <laughs> we don't have to ask you know, ask questions. I think the lawsuit speaks for itself. Jen, right? Yes. Jen. Hi, Jen Fifield with the Arizona Republic. It's nice to meet you in person. Um, I'm wondering if actually the associations can talk a little yes. bit um, about whether your members oppose the, man uh, the vaccine whether you see the importance of that vaccine in the space, or whether you're just opposing the mandate itself. Um, I can answer that. Um, my name is Yvette Burrow. I'm the Vice President of Fleet. Um, again, we, we agree with our brothers uh, in fire that it, it's an individual's right to choose, and that's where we're at uh, regarding their health. So uh, we, we had a survey a few months ago, and, and it was overwhelming. Um, we had over 600 members that said they would they would leave if they were forced to get a vaccine. We can't afford to lose one officer. Um, the message that everybody's saying out there is the citizens of Phoenix should be alarmed because of the uh, amount of police officers that are fleeing. We've never seen anything like that ever. And I'm telling you that the citizens of Phoenix shouldn't be just alarmed, they should be downright scared at this point. And so uh, our, our focus is we need to keep every single officer and we need to be able to fight for their right to choose on their health decisions. Would you spell your name too, please? B-R-O. So really it's the same issue for us. We, we don't get in the middle of our members and pick sides. We don't pick sides when we respond to the community. We're just here trying to do a job. We do support all of our members' right to choose whether they want to get vaccinated or not. I couldn't tell you off the top of my head what percentage of our membership is vaccinated or unvaccinated. I just know that it's dividing all of them. It's hurting the community right now even before we get into a mandate. It's just separated our, our members 
just like it's we're a microcosm of society. So it's no different than what you see everywhere else in the world. And it's really sad. It's disheartening because we built an organization and a and we've we've been part of an organization that has always been there for our community. We don't just work on fire trucks and respond. We raise millions of dollars every year for Phil Boot, for our members in the community, you know, who have muscular dystrophy. We do toys for tots, coats for kids, turkey drives. There's m much more that we do in the community. And that's why we would ask for anyone who would want to judge us as, as a local for defending these members or those members who are choosing not to get vaccinated at the time. The information has been confusing enough. I don't know how anybody ciphers through it. I really don't, and it's no different for us. It's very difficult on our members. Many of them are consulting their physicians and sitting down with their families and talking about the potential ramifications of whatever choice they're going to make. And we just have to be behind them, no matter what their decisions are. We don't get involved in abortion issues with them. We don't get in involved in gun rights with them. We don't get involved in those personal choices. We protect our members because they're our family, and they have families that need us. So that's what we'll do. And for some members of the community who might um, want to put the whole COVID aspect in it that you don't believe it, it, it it's, it's not about the beliefs in COVID and, and this illness. Try, can you try and explain that personal choice that these men and women are making for their benefit, for their family, for their personal lives? Sure. I, we respond on COVID calls. We're there for the community. My dad had a really horrible bout with COVID. We understand that the community needs to be protected when they're struggling to breathe we're responding and giving them breathing treatments and holding their hand on the way to the hospital those we're responding on people who are both vaccinated and unvaccinated so we don't ask them what if they've been vaccinated or it doesn't affect our treatment it doesn't affect the way we we handle them we would just ask for that to be done in return for us we want the same respect from our community that we give them We'll always be there for them, but no matter what they call for, that's what we do. The city of Phoenix, and this is true for PD also, this year we've had an increase in call volume. It's the greatest increase in call volume that we've ever had, and it's been growing exponentially anyways. So we are under-resourced, underfunded, and that's not because we can't, you know, the city isn't willing to fund us. It's just because money is getting tight. We don't have additional revenue streams. We're running out of options at this point. The dam has been built. The water level continues to increase, to quote a great friend of mine, who's one of our fire chiefs. We have to figure out a way to lower the water level. We can't build the dam any higher. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think a lot of people don't understand that you got a smallpox vaccination, right? Yeah. Got a mumps vaccination, right? Yes, sir. You, why can't you have a COVID vaccination? Why, why this argument over COVID when you're in the line of fire every day with something like this? We see stories every day of firefighters who die because of COVID. Of COVID. So for those folks that are hard-headed, like me maybe, um, explain that rationale. Well, you're not the only hard-headed person in the room, I can assure you that. I really can't. I don't know that anybody really can. I, I, you're right. Many of us, we have to get vaccinated when, when we get on the job, and we've done so. This is such a personal thing that our goal is just to keep our membership serving the community. And I'm not trying to give you a dance around, a political dance around. I'm just being honest with you. This has really divided families. And it's really hurting our community. It's hurting our fire department. Go okay. ahead. But can you truly say you're protecting the community? We members could act to actually be spreading COVID. Sir, we had a guy at my own fire station die, right? He's just, he was an unbelievable human being. I, I know what you're saying. We've mitigated communicable diseases our entire careers before COVID ever came out by wearing masks and gloving up. And we wear sleeves on calls. We put goggles on. So I think we do a great job of mitigating these emergencies as it is. And until these people feel comfortable doing that, I, who am I to tell them to do that? I understand where you're at with it. I really do. 
I, I just I don't know how to get in the middle of, of a doctor and a person, a, a firefighter, a police officer, or anybody else, and their decision to do what they feel they're doing. You got is, information coming out of Israel about you know antibodies, and can, I don't I personally can't tell you what is right and what is wrong. I know what my family has done. I know what we do. I just we cannot get in a, into a position where we're going against any one of our members. We have to support them. And they've been there for the community for decades doing this job with cancer exposures and all the other things that we're exposed to, heart disease, sleep deprivation. Our PTSD is off the charts right now. Our members that have PTSD and struggling with mental illness. By the way, these vaccinations have thrown some of them off of the edge and it's getting more and more difficult to console them. I would just ask everybody to put yourself in their shoes when they're when they're scared of this. I hope aren't, that you, aren't, you, aren't you feeding the doubts about the vaccine with this, I don't know, we hear this, we hear that. The documented ev evidence is very strong that this vaccine is safe. And furthermore, correct me if I'm wrong, 90% of the calls to fire are health emergencies, right? Yes. Yeah. So you are no different in many ways from the nurses in our hospitals, face to face with sick people. So can you respond to the fact to the question number one, are you feeding this false narrative that these vaccines are unsafe by taking this position? And number two, should folks who, who see a firefighter respond to a call ask them if they're vaccinated? Sir, I, I understand your point and, and I I really, I don't believe I'm feeding any kind of narrative at all. I'm here to protect our family. That's it. If individuals want to consult their physician and their families and they want to go get the vaccination, we have encouraged that, just so you know. We have encouraged that since the vaccines came out. But I cannot get in between a family member and their right to choose with their doctor and whatever information that they, I'm, I'm not an epidemiologist, I'm not a virologist. I, I barely graduated from high school, if you want to know the truth. So perhaps you shouldn't be speaking to no, the health issue. No, 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 sir. I'm elected by my body, the body of our firefighters, to speak for them, the one, on both sides, for those that are vaccinated and for those who aren't. So I'm absolutely in a position where I can speak on this. And I'm not speaking to the efficacy. I've read the New England Journal of Medicine's report on this. I've read the John Hopkins studies. I've studied all the, the state uh, court cases that have been adjudicated, all 58 of them across the country. I know what's happening out there. But I can also tell you I've had to be on the other end of a phone call when our firefighters are crying thinking that they're going to lose their job when they've served this community for 20 to 25 years. So I don't know how else to respond to that. These are our family members and the community cannot lose these individuals. They can't. We cannot survive the staffing crisis if we lose these members. I get that you're responding as a union leader, and I respect mm -hmm. that. But as a citizen of this community, seeing escalating cases, mm -hmm. seeing a relatively low vaccination rate, why aren't fire and police leading the way on this? Graham, he's asked, that, answered your questions a couple yeah. times. Does anyone have any other questions about the lawsuit today or anything else? General. General. Yeah, Mark. Where, is this part of what you filed in Monroe, Louisiana? Is this an attachment to that? Th that's a separate lawsuit. So we actually have multiple lawsuits on this issue. And I would just emphasize again that this is not an issue about the science or the efficacy of whether vaccines or their effectiveness. It's about the Constitution. And in times of crisis, that mark is when the Constitution matters even most. Because we've seen throughout the history of this country, there have been times and times of crisis, and whether it's the Korematsu case and other terrible U.S. Supreme Court decisions where crises have occurred and people's rights have been trampled. And so, as I've said from the beginning, no president has any authority to mandate any police officer or firefighter have to get the vaccine. And so that's what this is about. It's about the, it's about the Constitution, and that's why our lawsuit which I will add that I know there's uh, people in this room that were, that were critical of, um, but the bottom line is, is that it was always about the Constitution, whether the federal government could mandate it. And the other lawsuits relate to everything from, you know, this lawsuit relates to federal contractors. 
And as a result of the city being a federal contractor and other government agencies, you have the Biden administration essentially mandating that every employee in the city, whether they work the library, the police, the fire department, whatever, has to get the vaccine. We don't think that's constitutional. But the other lawsuits relate to um, uh, OSHA and the ability of uh, the federal government to promulgate rules dealing with any private employee anywhere. Perfect. We have time for one more question. I saw someone in the back. Yes. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Nick Phillips from the Arizona Capitol Times. Yeah. We talked a little bit earlier about the fact that there are other vaccination requirements that firefighters yeah. submit to, uh, you know, presumably uh, a whole lot of medical processes and procedures mm-hmm. that they're expected to follow in their job. Can you talk a little bit about what are the limitations of personal choice and personal opinion when it comes to how firefighters are prepared for and execute their work? I, I mean, what? just to stop this. I, I would so. never I would never want to second guess our brave first responders and how they take care of or their organizations well, take if, care of protecting the firefighter says I don't want to have any vaccination, I, I don't want to limit my that's, oxygen intake yeah. and wear a mask. Let me, that's let, a let question me, more for Let me answer meeting. the question. No, this is this is once again it's it's a fundamental question of does the federal government have the right or have the ability to mandate mandate vaccines? And the answer to that is clearly no. I mean I've got my Constitution right here. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with this, but where in the Constitution does it give any president uh, the authority or the ability to mandate you inject something into your body? And you know, the reality is, and going back even to Bram's question, I think the reason why there's a lot of maybe confusion or, you know, folks are concerned is because there's been a lot of inconsistent information that's been provided to the American public. No less than, you know, the current Vice President of the United States doubted whether she would get the vaccine if you had the um, Trump administration mandating it. At one point we were told the vaccines were this effective and that effective. And so, um, you know, again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, but there are studies, you know, firefighters mentioned the New New England Journal of Medicine, studies out of Israel. And I think that, you know, ultimately, um, you know, when the government is doing something, there's always this fundamental question is, is this the least restrictive way of of achieving achieving that result? And so, you know, for example, you know, people that have had COVID have antibodies. So, you know, maybe there's there's a different way to protect the community without resorting um, to something that I think is clearly unconstitutional. And that is the fact that no president, Republican, Democrat, independent, whoever they are, has the authority or has the ability to make you or anyone else put something into your body, period. And that's right. that's what our lawsuit's about, and it's as simple as that. And I appreciate, once again, I appreciate the fact that um, you have folks in the first responder community and other folks that appreciate how important this issue is not only for their membership but for the constitutional principles involved so thank you very much so much and thank you so much for fleeing united firefighter association i'll be out here after to ask any other questions that's an inappropriate question it's It's not the appropriate question this is the thing dennis i will i will tell everyone here i believe very strongly and um, the privacy of our medical and health information. And so my health information is is my own information. I would guess I would ask, Dennis, um, have you had an STD? No, I mean, no, seriously, if we're gonna start talking about people's personal health information, I mean, the point is, is that no government, no, no, no okay. government, no. Is there an STD it's, emergency right now? Well, you know, it's, if you listen, Bram, to the um, argument, it's funny, Judge Liberty brought up this point. In the 70s and 80s, there was, there was an outbreak and if you accept the notion that the federal government for public health reasons can mandate you to do something or not do something, um, then does that mean if there was an STD outbreak or health outbreaks in the 70s and 80s, could they tell you that you, if you're a government contractor or a, uh, an employee that has a contract with the government that you can't engage in intercourse with other human beings? I mean, that literally is a question the federal judge asks. So this is not a ridiculous question. The question should be, once you allow or cede this authority to the federal government, where does it stop? And my health information is my own health information, Dennis. Right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. So Thanks. Much. Thank question. you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Perfect. I got one more non-STD question. <laughs> Table. Hmm? <laughs> I 
next time and get that mold box up. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, should we leave them to tape for the next time? <laughs> yeah. Here you go.